No? Yes. <coughs> so I shall say something about silent message of nature. I'm coming from Slovenia. Slovenia is very famous for extremely beautiful nature, mountains, seaside, caves, and so on. So it's a very famous touristic area also. So uh, in my country, uh, it's very important to have this close contact with nature. We are living in times of some very rare and precious occasion. Nobody can deny that the external world is changing rapidly, and we must ask ourselves about our actual position within turbulent spiritual vortices of our era. Are we able, are we able to bring the invisible treasure to the other shore? This is quotation from Lord Buddha also. I should speak especially about the relation between the subtle and the manifested, as seen through the experience of a, a contemporary scientist. Yesterday there was a very beautiful introduction by the president, Tim Boyd, into the same topic, but I should speak about it from maybe from some more inner viewpoint. So let's first say uh, the, something about the meaning of silence. Let's observe our actual moment. Not too close because we hear the drumming of it. Oh, yes, thank you, thank you. Let's observe our actual moment. Yes, we are willing to observe it carefully. So, first we shall ask ourselves what observation is. In the first place, from the first step, observation means respect of silence. We are not afraid of silence, since when we are listening carefully, we find out that silence is very promising. It's the gate of awareness. It's the silent musician who is very patiently standing in front of us and waiting to sing another tune as soon as we are prepared. Silence is full of ever new meaning, acceptance of reality. Silence is full of understanding. So what is the multiverse of living beings? Our observation is impregnated by silence because only through this primordial silence we are able to hear tiny voices belonging to billions and billions of living beings. We don't know how many they are. We don't know how many the, these living beings are. But all of them are important, whether tiny or, or great. We even don't know if these beings, big or small, are pervading the whole vast universe. But let us believe that they do. They are wherever in the universe. That sounds beautiful, wonderful. In connectedness in space and time is a very important thing. It's the meaning, the deeper meaning of love. So let's spread our solitary moment of silence over the holiness of life that impregnates the universe. Whatever we might imagine by this evading word life, life we hear so many voices, roaring or subtle, and many of them are hardly discernible. We know that we are not alone. It is clear that all these beings are connected in space and time. So we are coming to scientific expression, space and time. But as soon as we are awakened within the flow of time, we are gifted by the living experience of love. If time did not exist, our world would be crystallized into some perfect, final form, and in that case, love would have no meaning. It's easy to imagine that hypothetical, unrealistic situation. Have you read The Snow Queen, a moving story written by the Danish writer Hans Christian Andersen? There is a curious boy, Kai by name, 
is he's trying hard to discover the eternity of perfection in glittering crystals of ice in the castle of the Snow Queen, but his work was in vain. Finally, he finds eternity within a warm relationship with a blooming life all around him. So love is the eternal link, like the glue that ties this momentary existence to the past and to the future. Now we must ask some unpleasant questions that are here in modern times about informational mess, about lies and truth, about the problem of authority and so on. As the members of a seven billion population, we are living compressed in human agglomerates in cities and so forth. Our basic needs are the same and many interests of other people are similar to our own interests. Therefore, we feel comfortable in the language of human behavior. We know that many, that what makes people happy. In principle, each one has capability of differentiation between good and bad. But many people are not listening carefully to the inner voice of ethical responsibility, to the voice of, which is called conscience. Or even worse, many of them have never awakened that inner voice. Maybe they have heard the voice in their young years, but have suppressed it later. Maybe they are blinded but by their so-called important, important position inside social structures. We can really play many tricks with other people. We can lie and deceive them, just in order to fulfill our interests on behalf of them. The world is full of manipulation. Political actions are impregnated with lies. And likewise, our financial and economic systems are impregnated by greed and will for power. In this area of communication, there are showers of information. In many places, even cacophony of information. But still the question remains, how can we discern truth from lie? The question of truth is neglected in our days. So, this last question leads us to the problem of authority. In older times, when people were still living in, sm in the midst of untamed wilderness, there was always a male authority in the role of protector from known or unknown dangers threatening from everywhere around. <clears throat> this person was a respected hero. He was praised in all of the ancient texts that we have inherited from those times. Let's recall Gilgamesh, then let's recall the heroes of the Old Testament, then powerful heroes of the ancient Greek mythology, or from the Indian mythology, or here in Western Europe of the Celtic mythology. Then there are numerous heroes of our folk tales and, folk tales and so on. So through our long history, the institution of authority has been established. But it's, it is important to know that the relationship between the authority and other people is always asymmetrical. It is unidirectional, and it goes together only with the pronoun, pro, pronounced hierarchical social structures. Quite many of these heroes just mentioned before were bloodthirsty. Authority functions through power, but history teaches us so well that the subtle boundary between beneficial social power and aggressive power, or maybe manipulative power in our days, it, this border is not clearly visible. We may be misled, and after some temporal delay, when, we, <clears throat> when the damage is maybe already too great, then we become aware of our misperception. When someone transfers his or her own power to someone, together with this, he or she transfers also most of the authentic spiritual insight. He's, tu <laughs> he's tuned into an instrument of an external interest 
into an instrument of external ego. So today we say that he is instrumentalized. So here is the modern problem of false authority. In modern circumstances, such a stance can engender endless problems. We are experiencing a totally new situation that has been experienced never before in human history. All seven billion of us living in the present global informational society, we are day by day bombarded by extremely powerful and large vortices of information, vortices resembling to tornadoes, and these vortices are all kinds of limited partial information or half-truths. And every day, we must learn anew and anew to discern truth from lie, otherwise we are quite easily manipulated. So we must develop our own insight. We should not rely on any external authority. It is important to know that insight has nothing to do with relation to some external authority. I think that all of us know this very well. We can learn from children from their way to insight. This insight, this process of discrimination, cannot be achieved merely by intellect. Why so? First, let's start with a simple example. Let's spend a time in a warm country with a simple and natural life, maybe far out in the countryside. There, maybe under palm trees in a jungle, or by the banks of a river, or in the green of large meadows, their children are not constantly led by their parents, they are not taken care by them constantly, and not even provided by just everything they want, in, they want to possess, like in rich countries. These children are free to invent their own toys and games. Maybe their parents are poor, maybe they are still happy, but maybe they are suffering in their wars to survive. Schools are small, simple, and natural. But these children must invent their own games, their own children's paradise. I hope that they don't get drowned into the children's mafia, what I have also seen in poor countries. So these children are not burdened with aggressive external information of the established of society. They get tuned directly to something inexpressible that is transcending the established human systems. So, these lucky children develop genuine love for life, love for a myriad of tiny voices. Through this creative process, they develop also intuition, their own inner and direct contact with the all-pervading beauty of life. I don't say that this picture of a poor country is a template of a, an ideal society, but shortly we should come back to this point. Now, what can we say about rational and intuitive approach to reality? So we are coming to this duality, rationality, and intuition. Let's have a brief look at the prevailing culture atmosphere of the Western society. By this, we mean especially Western Europe and North America and Australia and similar countries, since we know that in our days the trends of this very culture are, are quite aggressively imposing the trends of the whole global culture. In order to evaluate honestly these invisible influences, we must pay due interest to our cultural history. If we start from the 16th century, which was the closing part of the European Renaissance, the prevailing pivot of spiritual attention was the rise of the so-called Western intellect, which was so important for the birth of modern science. It turned out that evaluated develop, elevated development of rational thinking was very fruitful with, within the realm of natural sciences, at first in astronomy, 
with Copernicus, Kepler, and so on, but soon also in physics with Galileo, Newton, and so on. Then there were, was mathematics, a whole line of famous mathematicians of the 18th century, also many famous French mathematicians. Their names are inscribed on the Tour Eiffel. Then uh, there later also came chemistry and so on. This was therefore the age of reason. So during the last three of four or four centuries, it was un uncritically believed that human reason supplies us with complete understanding of the world and its ways, including even human soul and spirit. For instance, the science of biology followed the same mechanistical reductionism. There are large biomolecules, but we are trying to explain them with discrete atoms. That's reductionism. The same is true for modern psychology. By the expression scientific reductionism, we were speaking about this already yesterday, by this expression it's meant extract one single and isolated part of reality to find out the laws pertaining to this isolated part, and then finally to incorporate this part together with the newly discovered laws back to the all-embracing whole. In naive belief that these particular laws will function just as well inside the complete whole. Although we have studied these laws in one isolated system. So modern molecular biology, for instance, is a good example of scientific reductionism. And they are explaining, trying to explain life and even maybe spirituality in this way. So we can think much about incompleteness of rational approach. In modern days, especially during the last few decades, we are increasingly aware of one serious problem arising as soon as we reduce our perception of reality to some crystallized framework of rational assertions. Such wholly rational approaches, more or less, an oversimplified and fictitious view of reality. Why so? Rational assertions are always limited in number, but beings and influences and assertions among them are innumerable. In the beginning, I have spoken about innumerable beings in our vast universe. Achievements of modern science and technology are increasingly influencing our lives. We can say that life is becoming extremely dense and that no one can escape this density of experiences. We know quite well that influences are numerous and they are not isolate, isolated. All of them are interconnected in, into a single web of reality. Universe is inhabited by innumerable beings and he has said that love could be that reliable binding force that is holding together all these subtle influences. But how can this be realized into the framework of rationalized ideas, finite in number, the framework of partial truth, or maybe even half-truths? Reductionism has two faces. On one side, one can admit that isolated view of reality was a cardinal discovery of European culture, culture which was discovery begotten already within the ancient Greek science. So this reductionism was born in the ancient Greek culture. But on the other side, what one can also ask if we formulate it in the language of mathematics, we can ask whether the mistake originating from this simplification is really neg negligible. Maybe we have neglected one half of the universe, as Jean-Pierre Petit bears evidence. If he is right, the basic discovery of the European culture is simultaneously also its main fallacy. 
what seemed to be in the past centuries the promoter of development in modern circumstances is also its main hindrance. But, however, despite the, <coughs> the inadequacy of scientific method, let's be gentle with it. Why? The mainstream of modern science deals with partial truths because such is the method of this very science, science that, that we have developed, especially in the last four centuries, from the time of Galileo onwards. But let's be gentle and honest. There is nothing basically wrong with this scientifically me scientific method, obviously under condition that we are not that we are continuously aware of its inability to provide us with the so-called absolute truth. It's nothing wrong if astronomers provide us with images of distant galaxies. On the contrary, these pictures are the most wonderful proof of, of our internal link with the divine presence, with the divine presence that is pervading the whole wide universe. I only want to say that simultaneously we must take care also of the other half of reality, not the rational half, but also the intuitive half. So the problem is that science is stressing only one half of reality. There is no, <coughs> there is no intellectual way to absolute truth. There is no intellectual way to absolute truth. It is very questionable if we begin to argue, maybe just on the basis of such excellent and inspiring pictures from distant stars, that we know everything most important about our universe. And if we believe that we are given the key to its secret origin. Many prominent, prominent scientists are doing just that mistake, but I should not ma mention them. And similarly, it's highly questionable if, after detecting the Higgs particle, so-called God's particle, many scientists believe that a theory of everything, as they call it, is firmly established. Intellectual pride like this is baseless and totally futile. Namely, intellectual approach cannot provide us with any kind of finer theory, in spite of our vast and admirable knowledge. Yesterday we said about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. So at the end of this lecture I shall come to this point. If we don't respect the great unknown, we lose our subtle perception of reality and we lose our ability to explore the ability to discern the suchness of phenomena, Phenom to see the phenomena such as they really are, without any intellectual <coughs> burden. Silence is behind everything, and it is teaching us how to observe. Fitted out with this gift of silence, we are prepared to dismiss any kind of belief in some intellectual absolute. So there is a position. Modern scientific machinery versus loving observation of nature. Scientist is like a child who wonders about the vastness of the universe. Many prominent scientists who are really deep people said this. Einstein, for instance. Still, we don't lose anything by this seemingly, seeming sacrifice to dismiss the belief into some rational absolute, so we don't lose anything, since what is really precious is not some final theory, but our spiritual approach to investigation. Even if this approach cannot bring us to some final crystallized perception of reality, 
What is to be praised is our wonder of natural beauty without limits. The process in ourselves, in our soul. We are like children playing on the shore of an enormous ocean. Every wave that approaches from the distant horizon is a new wave. And every foaming splash designs a totally new pattern across the sandy beach. And every colored pebble or shell is extremely beautiful and different from any other, different in shape, in color. And there are also many tiny creatures living in the sand and so on. It is this innocent primal wonder what makes us really human and simultaneously divine. We are engaged in continuous search of, for the so-called truth, a concept that can never be adequately named. As soon as we enclose apparent truth into some crystallized form, then as soon as some relative truth is given the name of an absolute truth, but then surely it's truth no more. The last question, a quotation in Lao Zi's famous Tao Te Ching begins like this. He who knows does not speak. He who speaks does not know. About informational entropy. It is clear that we cannot, perce we cannot perceive reality unless we brush aside all intellectual interpretations. Brush it aside right from the first movement. But it is not an easy movement. It's more like a continuous process lasting the whole life. Continuously we need mindfulness, patient attention and spiritual strength and also courage and much, much more. All those are obvious prerequisites protecting us like an umbrella from confusion of informational showers, showers with enormous entropy of information. Every day we are ex exposed to all these rational argumentations. Words and pictures presented especially through modern electronic media are permanently bombarding us living in this modern world. Knowledge about nature has grown so much and we know so many of her ways, but it is partial and rational knowledge, therefore limited within its own realm. It's contaminated with information and entropy. Modern society is in many ways pushing us right away from that simple and sober state of mind which has always been so dear to lovers of nature and so dear to real scientists and it will be always remain dear to them also in future. So there is a threat of loss of spiritual freedom if we are succumb to these false beliefs. There are new traps around. Yes, we can arrange our machinery working for us. Robots, which are supported by modern science, they are protecting, uh, producing nice cars for our comfort and leisure. A modern man is nearly sure of his supremacy over nature. But the greatest danger is hidden right here in our apparent supremacy over nature, in our self-sufficient pride. Our technical abilities have become so powerful that they are threatening our authentic human nature, the experiencing of our own soul. A great part of our modern world has succumbed to crazy belief that our human civilization can function like a machine and is already f uh, impartially functioning alike. And that also our human soul can function like a machine. So this is the false belief. The modern man is constantly wired through internet so he's not free. In fact, he has forgotten what the true meaning of free time is. He must promptly serve the requirements of invisible people behind the great world wide web. 
So here is the danger. In contrast to our extremely efficient intellectual and technical machinery, a human being is quite frail in physical sense, but also with regard to intellectual arrangements of so many data. So the machinery we have established has grown so powerful that most of us have forgotten who we really are in spiritual sense. The external machinery is becoming internalized. Hence, this vast external and internal mach machinery has lost its driver. Our discriminative intuition or spiritual insight, buddhi or vipassana in, ses in Sanskrit, and this machinery has run, run out of our control. No one can stop it anymore because it is fueled by never-ending competitive efforts of the actual neoliberal economy and society. So we must see the things clearly not to be entrapped into this machine. The economy of the present time is not based upon some spiritual values, at least from the times of David Hume, living in the 18th century. It's based upon human greed, as David Hume uh, uh, based the <coughs> values of econ modern economy. And this <coughs> has become extremely dangerous, as indicated by actual effects about global ecological situation and about the effects of the prevailing state of human sanity. Global situation with extremely high social entropy and so on. So now we are prepared for bridging science and spirituality into fresh, in a fresh modern light. So this was mainly about the problems of modern times, but I had to say, th say something about that because uh, uh, we cannot just uh, uh, fly away of uh, reality. So if we want to bridge science and spirituality, uh, we must um, go from both sides to make this bridge. Uh, Silent steps into the embrace of nature. Let's say what this is. In the calm of night, we, should, we could listen to symphony of stars. We could even hear the subtle interplay of cosmic magnetic fields. They all wanted to tell us something. And now, before dawn, their message has become dense. It's ready to materialize in front of us. And now, still again, it's early morning. The first light is getting in. In this dawn, we can see how our living Earth has materialized. Now her shapes are visible, and we can see them dancing. In sober freshness of this morn, we are invited by distant, unknown horizons. So we go out and we instantly feel a great joy under the open sky. There are white oceans, and there are large forests. The living breath of nature is so broad that we cannot foresee all of her ways. And this is exactly what we feel, why we feel this joy. We are free. We have abandoned the unnecessary and petty need for control. Why should we carry that burden? Our modern society is burdened with this need for control. Technology has somehow misled us into mm, this false belief. We are li liberated from crystallized forms. Nature is so wide, and she is our great teacher. She teaches us to see the bare suchness of things and phenomena. Suchness is in Sanskrit paratantra or tathata. Suchness that is free from preconceptions of any kind. Also, science should be based on 
experiencing this suchness of phenomena. Calm abiding in this experience is something most beautiful, most precious, most liberating. If we stay a long time within the embrace of nature, and after listening patiently for many days or maybe for many years to her whispering, step by step we foster that quality of mind which we call intuition. So intuition is not just a flash, momentary flash coming from somewhere, but it's a constant process lasting the whole life. In modern rational culture, it's very unclear what the meaning of the word intuition really is. We cannot learn intuition from another person or from a book. One even cannot analyze the process of intuition in rational terms. So, I shall rather resort to more poetic language. We are aware of the silent painter behind the beauty of phenomena. From the first breath, silence is the artist of enlightenment. Our own ability of perception is a process that is born from inner heart. It's our inner angel or cosmic being who fears and knows eternal life of the whole universe. When observing this passionately and equanimously through intuition, we can see simultaneously all parts of the whole. Although maybe some particular part is not perceived with, the, with that admirable resolution as it may be perceived through the process of reason. We can even see the whole within a single tiny part. A poet would say that he can see the whole world in a dew drop, like the whole world is reflected in a single part of the God Indra's web as an old Indian myth is going. Now back to intuition versus rational thinking. What's the relation between these two? We can compare this act of observation to the act of observing a hologram. Do you know what hologram is? It's a picture made by laser light. And if we look into this picture, we see the three-dimensional picture. But uh, so we can see it from every angle as it was really there in three dimensions. But the very interesting thing is that if we look only one part of hologram, we can see the whole picture in every small part. A small opening in the hologram displays the complete picture, although optical resolution is much better when we observe the entire hologram. The same quality can be attributed also to our creative process. It starts with intuition. Then right from the beginning we get some sense of the whole new land that we are exploring. Maybe this is still quite vague a sense. And only very gradually we assume one by one the discrete attributes of reason. Rational thinking includes continuous testing by the classical method of trial and error. In that way, we perceive the contours of reality more clearly, and so gradually we improve the resolution of separate parts. But intuition still remains throughout the whole creative process. It's like water that impregnates the dry pulses of soil so that they are not separated one from another. At least from time to time, we should reverse back to intuition. Otherwise, we may lose our creative insight, namely from love for life, fully impregnated by intuition, as the wet soil is impregnated by water, from this spiritual insight originates also. And hence, if this insight is not cultivated, the sense of someone's activity is quite obscure, and one may even forget what the main priorities are. It is so often in modern scientific research, which clings too much to technology and not enough to deeper values, mix, uh, <coughs> deeper values fused with spiritual insight. 
creativity in scientific research, what we, we can say about this. When we import these simple ideas into the realm of scientific research, we obviously meet the following question. Is scientific research of an intuitive type or is it a rational type of creativity? During the first creative phase, the leading expression of mind is intuition, or at least it should be, while later, during the communicative phase, when a scientist should transmit his findings to the scientific community, then we must cling to rational languages of expression. Similarly, Henri Poincaré, at the end of the 19th century, declared, communication among scientists is based on bare facts, while discoveries are based on imagination. In addition to this, Andrei Zupancic, a famous Slovenian biologist, complimented, the creative phase is inductive and hypothetical, while the communicative phase is deductive and empirically verifiable. But in practice, final verification of scientific results often leads back to new methods, and these methods are again developed by intuition. Therefore, sharp division between the two is quite impossible. We should rather say that intuitive and rational approaches are entwined together into a single creative process. In short, the both types are necessary. In the creative phase, a scientist's work is intuitive, illogical, and metaphorical, beyond words, while in the communicative phase, it's rational, logical, and apt for verbal expression. It's now uh, going to the center of our uh, interest, science and spirituality. A stubborn rationalist, or alternatively, on the other extreme, a religious fanatic, such a man would say that scientific creativity and spiritual liberation are two totally separate realms of our human existence. But such a view is unjustifiably truncated. It is advocated mainly by those who only read about the final and visible achievements of modern science, but who don't take any active part in its deeper philosophical and spiritual implications. Namely, as we have seen, the two apparent extremes that I mentioned before are originating from the same source. All great scientists have given full tribute to meditative insight into fresh ideas that never before have been considered seriously. It was just this spiritual insight that had led, uh, led them into newly discovered lands and also gave them strength and patience so necessary to persevere on their difficult path, maybe against many oppressions of conservative society within a certain period. It was always so and it is remaining so. In, also in modern times. Also, we have this so-called religion of science in these days. And now I shall end with the idea of Orphism, which is the union of science, art, and spirituality. Remember only the ancient Orphic scientists, like the great Pythagoras. His mathematical laws of music scales were, to him, grammar of a definite divine language. Or maybe on another side of timeline, remember Einstein's reflections on philosophy, together with his playing a violin. When reading biography of such great scientists or inventors, again we are aware of their continuous tie with the transcendental divine. Yes, definitely. It was the source of their inspiration. In our living experience, science and spirituality are only two different expressions, two different modes of manifestation, uh, 
pertaining to the same reality. And as in the Indian philosophy, he said, the observer and the observed are fused into one. Thank you. <laughs>